Welcome everybody to the Salem Literary Festival presented by the Salem Athenaeum. Welcome to our panel this hour, The Forest for the Trees, Climate Change and Fiction. That's a bit of a switch from this morning at nine o'clock when we discussed the tree line with Ben Rollins. That is nonfiction. Welcome to our panel this hour. Your questions, if you have them, and we hope you do, I'm sure you will, for the end of the session can be put in the Q&A on your screen. For closed captioning, go to the CC box. That's on your screen as well. An anti-harassment statement is at the top of the chat. We don't expect problems, of course, but we want everyone to feel comfortable and safe. And now to our guests. Allegra Hyde, whose roots are in Peterborough, New Hampshire, is the author of Eleutheria and the short story collection of this new world which won the John Simmons Short Fiction Award, a recipient of three Pushcart Prizes, and that is a big deal. Allegra's writing has been anthologized in Best American Travel Writing and Best of the Net, among others. And did you happen to catch her a few months ago on Late Night with Seth Meyers? Yes, yeah, she was a guest, and you can see that on YouTube. Allegra has received fellowships and grants from the Elizabeth George Foundation and the U.S. Fulbright Commission, to name two. She teaches at Oberlin College in Ohio. Joining us from the UK is Jessie Greengrass. Her collection of short stories and account of the decline of the great auk, according to one who saw it, won a Somerset Mom Award, the Edge Hill Prize, and was shortlisted for the Sunday Times PFD Young Writer of the Year Award. Her first novel, Sight, was shortlisted for the Women's Prize, her most recent novel, The High House, which we'll discuss today, has been nominated for the Costa Novel Award and the Orwell Prize for Political Fiction. She and her partner and children live in Northumberland, England, near the border with Scotland. Travel three miles west, make that 3,000 miles, and you have our moderator, Erica Forensic who lives outside of Boston and is praised for her literary thrillers that feature women who face extreme physical challenges in the natural world. Erica spent weeks in the wilderness of Northern Maine to research her debut novel, The River at Night. And for her follow-up into the jungle, Erica journeyed 100 miles up the Amazon to experience the perilous Peruvian jungle. Now, inspired and informed by a month-long trip to Greenland, Erica says Girl in Ice, a New York Times and Wall Street Journal editor's pick in one of the world's most unforgiving landscapes. Can't wait for us to begin. So let's do that now. Erica, you want to take it? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Thank you so, so much, Diane Stern, and everyone involved in this beautiful, wonderful Salem Literary Festival. I know so much goes on behind the scenes uh, to put this together, and it's, it's, it's kind of heroic, actually. It's amazing. So what I'd like to do is I'm not sure whether that's okay. Um, okay. <laughs> okay. Erica is frozen just for a moment. Uh, do we want to we, should, should we read? Yes, yes. Yeah. Why don't we start and do that? Pick a, pick a, a portion of the books and then we can go back to Erica. Good idea, thanks. I think Allegra, you go, you go. <laughs> sure, um, well, I'll start by just saying a little bit about my novel, Eleutheria. Um, it is a book about a, a young woman who travels to the Bahamas, um, to the island of Eleutheria to join um, a compound of environmentalists. And um, this young woman will has the goal of um, making a tangible impact on climate change. Um, but what she finds at this compound is not what she expects. Um, and she also discovers that she can't outrun her past or the island's past in a sense. So, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so it's a book about reckoning with our future as well as our past as individuals and um, as a society. Uh, it's also a book about love, Freegans, Harvard, terrariums, um, doomsday prepping, and many other things. Um, so I'm just gonna read a paragraph from the very beginning. 
And just to give you a sense of the book's vibe. Maybe I should have thought about where I was going when I first careened over the archipelago in a turboprop gunshot from Florida. And those islands looked to be all beach. The Bahamas scattered along the turquoise lip of the Caribbean. Their coastlines sandbar swirled, coral dazed. The islands so low in the water they seemed poised to hold their breath. A little more sea level rise and they'd be washed away. Already their edges were eroding, ocean swells grabbing at coastal roads, at the underbellies of beach houses not yet leveled by hurricanes. The worst of the storms had turned whole resorts to matchsticks, their swimming pools gone green from neglect, pagodas engulfed by vegetation, hibiscus blooming in marble bathrooms, quail doves shitting on embroidered towels, another empire born and bowed. And yet, when I looked down from the turboprop, pressed my face to its oval windows, I felt only possibility. I felt more than alive. And I'll pause there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Desi, you want to tell us about the High House and <laughs> do a little read? Okay. Yeah, so the High House is a novel that um, it begins, it's sort of set in a near future. Well, we have, it's here, but I, I lost the cover. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. But, um, it, it, it's set in the near future in which the kind of climate crisis has progressed. Um, and it follows um, four characters as this crisis goes from future to past. So it, it follows them through the kind of the lead up to a disastrous flood and then takes them a little way into the aftermath. But it's, it's, it's so the four characters come together um, in this house called the High House, which is um, on the edge of the coast. Um, which has been designed to be a bunker. And it's really about how they deal with what, what they've been through, how they build relationships with one another and, um, and, and about the limits of, that, of, of their survival. So, um, I will read. I left school for good at lunchtime on the day I turned 18. I walked home. The house was empty. I had no plans either for the afternoon or for the time beyond it. My life which stretched empty ahead or didn't. It was becoming clear to everyone now that things were getting worse. The winter before, half of Gloucestershire had been flooded and the waters refusing to recede had made a new fen covering homes and fields, roads, schools, hills rising from it like islands. In York, the river had burst its banks and the city centre was gone. Walls which had stood for nearly two millennia washed halfway down to Hull. People didn't say these places were gone. They didn't say that there were families living in caravans and service stations all along the M5, lined up in the car parks with volunteers running aid stations out of the garage forecourts. People said, they must have known their homes were vulnerable. We were protected by our houses and our educations and our high street shopping centres. We had the habit of luck and power and couldn't understand that they were not our right. We saw that the situation was bad elsewhere, but surely things would work out because didn't they always for us? We were paralysed unable to plan either for a future in which all was well or one in which it wasn't. Thank you very much. Um, I was just enthralled with both of these books and in love with them. And I highly recommend them. They are so different, which uh, doesn't surprise me. I mean, obviously we all have our takes on this, on climate fiction. I'm gonna read a really simplistic uh, definition of, of climate fiction. So just bear with me. And then we're going to talk about um, what it really is. <laughs> okay. So climate fiction, uh, literature that deals with climate change and global warning, warming, sorry, not necessarily speculative in nature. Works may take place in the world as we know it or in the near future. This genre, and if they're calling it a genre in this description, we can talk about that, uh, frequently includes science fiction and dystopian or utopian themes, imagining the potential futures based on how humanity responds to the impacts of climate change. So different uh, words for this. I found, you tell me more, eco-fiction, eco-lit, nature fiction, cli-fi. And I want to hear examples from you, but first just some examples I found going way back and of course to the present, um, Jules Verne, J.G. Ballard, uh, Frank Herbert's Dune, Michael Crichton's State of Fear, Margaret Atwood in her dystopian trilogy, Oryx and Crake, 
Year of the Flood and Matt, and Matt Adam. Am I saying that correctly? Of course, The Road by Cormac McCarthy and um, Ian McEwan's Solar, which deals with artificial photosynthesis and a lot of other things. Um, Bone Clocks by David Mitchell. And we were going to have Charlotte, um, Charlotte McConaughey here. She couldn't make it, but um, she wrote, as we all know, Migrations and um, Once There Were Wolves. And going way back, the earliest example I could find, 1925, uh, a short story by Ernest Hemingway, Big Two-Hearted River. And this is about World War I vet Nick Adams, and he's coming out of World War I, and he's traumatized, but he goes back to nature. He goes uh, along a river to find the regenerative pow powers of nature. The fish in the stream with their muscular bodies the way a grasshopper alights on his hand and takes off. Um, and of course, The Grapes of Wrath, 1939, you know, John Steinbeck, um, the defenestration created by the dust storms, which forced immigration of entire groups of people. But I'm interested in what, what are some examples of climate fiction that you can think of? Um, and then we're going to, I'd like to find out, like, you know, talk more about the definition of it. For example, not only just you know, contemporary examples, but any examples, maybe some from, from your childhood or, or any examples that, you, that jump to mind. Um, I mean, like if, you, if, if you're kind of thinking about sort of earlier books, yeah. then um, I mean, one that I read when I was probably in my early teens and was like really disturbed by. <laughs> <laughs> was what? Yeah, really. It <laughs> was um, the Death of Grass. Um, oh. by which is utterly terrifying and it is it and, and I reread it quite recently and um it remains utterly terrifying and if anything it's more terrifying. oh my god I, I have to death uh, by who uh John Christopher's I think it's John Christopher's. is it a short story or novel no, no it's a novel it's a short novel oh. um but it, it is I mean it does what it says in the title so uh, there a, a virus kills all grass which means that it also kills wheat rye barley anything right um, so this kind of, um, yeah, this kind of uh, devastating. That's a bummer. Yeah. <laughs> that um, and then obviously yeah. sets off kind of mass famines, um, yeah. like civil unrest, the breakdown of kind of society. And it, 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 it really un kind of unravels very quickly. <laughs> there. Um, but kind of more recently, it feels like, you know, I, I, I sort of, like I don't kind of seek out climate fiction, but it, it also seems increasingly like, um, you know, it, it's harder to find books in which it isn't right. a kind of theme or an issue because it, you know, it's, it's, it's so prevalent. It's so obvious. It's kind of so ubiquitous, right. you know, that fear. It's like, it kind of feels like it would be hard to write a book and not have that kind of creeping at the edges. Yeah, right? I've thought that as well. I mean, just how, how do you, there's no use avoiding it. I mean, this is our life right now. And, and as jo our job as fiction writers was to engage in life uh, in whatever way. Um, we have a drought going on in New England that has just been painful to watch. Um, and I think we're all affect affected by it at some level. Um, so Allegra, what, what books, maybe well, in your childhood and then, or, and then moving up from there or? In terms of recent um, works of climate fiction, I think about maybe, you know, Matt Bell's Appleseed yeah. or Jenny Offal's um, Weather or um, Diane Cook's uh, The New Wilderness um, or um, Alexander Kleeman's um, uh, Something New Under the Sun. Um, there's, there's just so many. Uh, in terms of defining climate fiction as a genre, that's something I've been kind of wrestling with a lot uh, yeah. lately. Is it a genre or are we kind of bringing together all these different, uh, really disparate books and calling them a genre when they really, you know, maybe they mention a solar panel or nature <laughs> doing something, um, you know, all these different- And it's kind suddenly of climate fiction, moments. right? Yeah. And it's only climate fiction. Um, right. And there are people who have made the case that, you know, all books are climate fiction. They're all, whether they're speaking to um, the climate catastrophe or not, just by showing people interacting with the world, that's inherently climate fiction in some way, which also seems almost, you know, too broad as well. 
Um, an idea that I've been kind of um, mulling over is the possibility that what defines climate fiction and what unites climate fiction across um, science fiction and realism and um, other kind of aesthetic modes is that um, works of climate fiction have this uh, kind of oscillation between utopia and dystopia in some way. Right. Where there's yeah. possibility of like, either we're in a kind of paradise that then changes or we're in a dystopia that has the possibility to go the other way. Now, this is a theory that I would say is still in progress, but it's um, it's an idea that uh, I'm, I, I know is on, on my mind when it comes to defining this genre. Yeah, I mean, I... I... I mean, if you're going to ask what climate fiction is, you can't, I almost have to go back to the definition of genre. Like, what does, what does genre mean? I, I think genre is a presentation mode. So I, you could, you can, you know, there can be a murder, but it can be a comedy. It can be literary fiction. It can be a thriller. It can be a meditation. Um, so um, it's, it's a way of, you know, taking an idea and making it like, and giving it a name so that, you know, and I'm, we can go to the bookstore or online and say, what is it? You know, it's like when we're buying, when we're going not to bring in, you know, the whole mercenary part of it, like, but we have, when we're going to buy a book, we say, what is it? What am I buying? Or what am I? And so almost of necessity, we start calling books by, the, by, by genre. But I think that um, climate fiction is unique. It's not, it's something we're going through right now. And um, I don't know, as, as, as fictional, I mean, I have a lot of trouble pr for my own fiction, processing it fast enough so that I can create the story that hopefully won't be, I don't know, obsolete or, 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 or just like silly by the time it comes out, <laughs> or just, I don't know, how do you deal with the fact that it's happening now and you're writing about it now and you're almost... And whereas, yeah, think about, I don't know, if you're gonna write about World War II, World War II happened, you can process it. Um, it definitely felt like it was a really weird thing to mm -hmm. be writing sort of a novel that was kind of ostensibly set in the future, but to find that, you know, as, as I was writing it, you know, I was writing in like 2019. Um, and so it, it really felt like it was this kind of, fracture point I think when when things you know it like really during the course of the year that I was writing everything speeded up um even pre-covid so it, I was kind of writing it and then I'd be I'd be thinking around I need you know I need I need another thing what what other thing can there be like what other sort of disaster might you watch that's kind of a climate disaster and then you'd, I'd look at you know I'd swap tabs on my laptop and there'd be wildfires in Australia and right. it's like wow well, so, okay. <laughs> okay, yeah it was such a kind of weird and sort of like, you know, it's sort of destabilizing experience to be trying to write into a future that was was happening as I was kind of writing it. It was it was very peculiar and, and, and like, you know, um, it, yeah, it's sort of I mean, it wasn't quite lonely, but it was it was definitely kind of um, it, it sort of felt like I was in this kind of bubble. It was very strange. Did, did you feel did you frighten yourself? As you were writing it? I mean, I think I wrote it in part because I was already frightened, but um, certainly didn't help. <laughs> you would, I'm sorry. It didn't help. It, you know, I didn't, it didn't help. help, right, yeah. I'm wondering, Jesse, I, I know that you were writing into the um, the future, and I was too, and a kind of near future in Eleutheria, mm -hmm. and I know that I, I had some speculative disasters that kind of came true in a weird way, and that I... I found really disturbing. For instance, um, I got really interested in mass mortality events among animals, and there's a um, if you if you look into this, they're they're happening all the time, all over the world. Whether it's um, you know dolphin pods mysteriously beaching themselves or um, any any number of things, and I predicted a um, uh, a mass um, a mass death of birds that's kind of a pivotal point in, in my book and then a, a little while later saw some videos of like mysterious math mass death of birds 
this. And um, it uh, it's kind of one of the weird feelings I think of that can come up writing climate fiction is that when you're when you're thinking about what could happen, especially in in a kind of imminent way, um, you see some of that coming true. Yeah, I think so. I think that I was also specifically trying to write. So one of the things that really interested me was that quite a lot of the things that we worry about in terms of climate change, um, and this is a very local we, this is like a, a white Western we, um, are, so, you know, in, in, in the UK, there's this real worry about flood, you know, about flooding, about kind of coastal erosion. But the, the peculiar thing about that is that, is that those things, you know, 50 years ago, flooding and coastal erosion were a fact of life for many people a lot of the time. Like, the, you know, people right. were their livings from the sea and, you know, were living in kind of coastal communities that were very vulnerable. There's some kind of pre-flood defences. Um, and so I think that we've got that the, the kind of ground, what, what was kind of interesting was the idea that this kind of, this belief in our safety is like a really recent belief, mm. but we can't get, we can't get outside of it to realise that actually, you know, we have always been quite vulnerable um, and that yeah. that vulnerability is returning like a, a million times worse. But but we can't kind of say that we, it's not like, it's not exactly new. You know, so, so this, this idea of, of um, you know, inundation, I was right, there was a, there was a terrible flood in the, in the very early 50s um, in the North Sea. Um, it was devastating on the northeast coast of the UK, but much more so in uh, kind of low-lying parts of continental Europe. Um, like um, the Netherlands was kind of, like a third of the Netherlands was, un, was, you know, was underwater for a long time. Um, oh. And, and as a result of that, things like the Thames Barrier were built and everyone forgot about it. You know, we feel that now. And suddenly we're returning to that precarity, having forgotten that it was ever there before. And I find that really interesting. Yeah, in your book, many times there are these sort of moments of like, you know, the moments sort of terror of terror, and then they do something about it. And then it's kind of okay for the moment. And they sort of forget about it and move on. And then they, something worse happens and it's like, oh yeah, we're still screwed. You know, um, this is still going to, to ramp up. Um, so just, uh, let's see, I was going to ask, you know, just kind of go back to sort of genres and, and that whole discussion. Um, in one of your interviews, Allegra, you say, uh, you, you don't like the classification so much. Uh, you like to break free a bit and include humor, sex, beauty, and love, which <laughs> I just thought was so refreshing. You know, uh, we're so under pressure to write these books once we've announced what they are in a certain genre. Um, and but you've experienced, I think, in your and your teaching, you mentioned that your students have different ideas. Can you talk about that? What what younger writers today think about all of this? Well, I, I don't discussion. Uh, I don't know them, but um, you know, I've noticed that my students are are really interested in collaborative work and mm. um, co collective writing in a way, and yeah. they're also are really really invested in bringing joy to writing in a variety of ways. And I think it may be in some ways a reaction to having grown up in particularly tumultuous times mm -hmm. and. Um, I think they, uh, uh, a kind of critique of literature that they often bring to me, um, sometimes huffily, is that literature is always full of so much suffering and so much pain, and um, they they just find that um, hard. And yeah. I'm not going to throw out, you know, suffering in literature, but I I <laughs> um, I am interested in finding ways to think about the the full scope of the human experience. Um, and, you know, like my students, I'm also really interested in figuring out how can we embody collectivity either in the creation of work or in what a, a work represents so that um, with, with a piece of writing in particular, it's not just um, uh, so much a, a product of like an individual genius with this individual perspective, but is, is maybe tapping into um, something else. Yeah, I found that fascinating. And actually, uh, first of all, when you said we were talking about suffering, I wasn't sure if you were referring to um, the actual act of writing, which just involves lots of suffering. 
or uh, the, what they're reading, but then you clarified that. And um, wow, collective right. I don't know. I don't know if I could do that. I think um, not that I believe in my genius so much. It's more like uh, I'm not a, I'm not a collaborator, but I learned that writing screenplays. It's like, no, I don't want you to, work, you know, change a thing, you know, but, uh, but I, I, I think that's, I, I find that refreshing. Are you, um, so um, what about, what about, um, let's see, I guess I, have, I wrote a short list of why write about climate in fiction. I'm gonna read a few and then I want you guys to, to chime in. So why write about climate fiction today? Explore disaster scenarios to make us fall in love with what's still good and beautiful in this world to move readers to action. Why, so can you think of any more that might be an impetus for writing about it today? I mean, I, I sort of, you know, it, it, it like it just felt to me that I didn't know what else to write about. Really. I could, you know, uh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, I don't, I don't know if, if, if I'd written at that point about something else, it would have just felt like I was shutting my eyes, you know, like, and, and kind of. Um, so this book, The High House, it, I could feel it. It almost felt like it had to come out of you. I mean, the, the it's such a. There's something so there's something simple yet complex about it, um, but very very primal, you know. And I felt I just I felt I just felt reading it like and isn't that like the best way when you're writing a book to uh, isn't that the best way to feel when it really feels like is that how it felt that it felt like okay this has to come out of me now or else um, <laughs> yeah no I um I mean I I think that I just felt very very sad you know like I, I feel yeah. sad I love the place that I live. Um, and the, the landscape in the high house is very much a, a, a sort of mishmash of, of, of a couple of different places down up and down this coast, um, and and I would and, and and the landscape has always been a kind of you know it's felt like a retreat right you can go you can go and yeah. sit on the beach and suddenly everything feels better and you know you're great but right. except that you can't do that because you sit on the beach and you think you know I don't know what's in the sea anymore. And you know, as um, Allegra mentioned, kind of um, the 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 birds. Um, so we have had um, absolutely devastating outbreaks of bird flu. Um, oh. It's meant that you know you go to the beach and there are like twenty dead birds on the beach every tide. Um, so it, you know, it, it, and it just feels so sad, and it feels sad yeah. to me. Kind of loss is pervasive, and so I think that, and I think that writing about that and talking about it you know, writing as a way to kind of open conversations about it. Yes, exactly. It, you know, allows that to be, um, to become a kind of communal experience. And that feels very important. And it feels like we're, unless we can do that, when we're not going to be able to move on to the bit where we can possibly change. Right. I mean, I was, I actually, both your books made me cry <laughs> uh, at the end. Um, but, uh, it, but but it was a different feeling. I mean, it, and um, but there were sparks of joy at the end. Of, and I'm not going to do any spoilers here. But going back to your birds, I remember you made uh, there was some place in the book where because of climate change, the birds had forgotten to migrate or they didn't get the signals, mm. which was like holy crap, that really got to me. Um, and um, yeah, so I. I and I was especially struck um, in your book, Allegra, just with, I never read a book about climate change with, or with climate change as, as a theme, which with, it was so completely real, meaning so terrifying. And yet you also had this wonderful spark to, to you. You have this wonderful, way of saying, well, here's what we can do. Um, and here's, here's hope. And yeah. so talk more about that. I think when I set out to write this book and yeah. I, I knew I wanted to write about climate change, it, it, it also felt like, how could I not write about it? Yeah. Um, 
I wanted to use fiction as a space to visualize people problem solving or trying to problem solve because yeah. I am of the belief that um, fiction storytelling can um, be a way for us to imagine other possibilities yes. imagine um, different ways of being and kind of help make those real. And um, does the problem solving that my characters engage with necessarily work? Is it necessarily the right path forward? Um, maybe, maybe not, but it felt important to at least show people trying. Um, I also, uh, I think, wanted to try to write climate fiction that um, just brought together many different um, bodies of knowledge in a way that I think fiction uniquely can do. Uh, you know, you can write a, a research paper about birds falling from the sky and that can be really useful and that's important, but to put um, that bird incident in relation to colonial history, in relation right. to um, a weird speculative eco compound, in relation to an individual <laughs> person who is having relationships and hardships and works at a donut shop and is trying to figure things out. I hoped that that kind of contextualized it, um, what's and had a love affair. And it was just love. like, you know, we have love affairs. I mean, I just, I just, I love that mix, you know, of, of just, how do you say build? I'll never say buildings, Roma. Uh, yeah, word. I'm not going to try to say I don't to say that. Okay. <laughs> You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I hoped to make climate fiction feel feel human as well as just full of um, reality. And I hoped that by combining those different things, the joy and in a way, a kind of expression of facts and statistics um, and projections, uh, it became more easy to, became easier to digest and, um, and to maybe act upon. Yeah, I mean, um, can I actually just, so there's a there's a part in Eleutheria, Eleutheria? am I mm -hmm. saying that right? Okay. Where you um, go into this, so this amazing list of what we can do and it, and it breaks the narrative, but it's fine. It's amazing. So I'm not even gonna read the whole thing because it's take, it'll take too long, but it, I'm just gonna read like the first paragraph, okay? And this happens, uh, I'm not quite sure exactly what happens right before, but you'll get the idea. So just a little quick, just a minute. And this is chapter 10. Turn off your lights, turn off your computers, your printers, your phones, your security systems, your air conditioning, air conditioning, your robot vacuums, your entertainment consoles, your microwaves, your heat sensing pillows, and your electric toothbrushes. Pull out all the other plugs, drive less, bike more, find alternatives to flying plant trees, plant native trees, plant flowers and vegetables, and then eat the vegetables and some of the flowers, clean your plate, compost scraps, divert gray water for irrigation, take shorter showers, use biodegradable soap and make your own cleaning products, air dry laundry, repair the clothes you have, repair the shoes you have, repair furniture, repair houses, repair friendships, and have your friends over for dinner. Speak to strangers, skill share, ride share, babysit, house sit, house share, reuse, reduce. Work less, buy nothing, no straws, pick up litter, keep bees. <laughs> I don't know, just, I mean, like, I was exhausted just reading that. But I mean, I just felt like, you know, this, this, this sort of injection into the, into the narrative was just like so different and, and refreshing. And, um, and I guess in Jesse's book, I was like, oh my God, this is terrifying and depressing. But the, there was this, this sort of thread of beauty and just, relationships and love and family and and like does you know what is going to save us maybe it's going to be that you know so uh I just I just was really moved by both of those different threads in your stories um so I wanted to any other thoughts on climate on climate fiction or anything like that because I'm going to move on to something else or anything else that I'm talking over you guys that you want to say at the moment okay um, I want to talk something about the that list and I just yeah, wanna, tell, yeah yeah go ahead um for those who haven't encountered the list it then it moves from these individual actions to yeah. kind of community actions and then to 
um, global actions. Right. Uh, so I think it's important to just um, for that that list in general that it's it's speaking about individual and collective actions, and that right. addressing the climate crisis is very much a a combination of those things. And um, I maybe that gets back to just my thinking about um, doing doing things collectively, doing things as an as an individual. And um, mm -hmm. our our society is so um, individual uh, obsessed with individuality and like individual action and individual agency. And so mm -hmm. kind of broadening that list from recycling to um, global treaties uh, right, it's really right. important to kind of draw that connection because in the end of the day, without creating more regulations, um, without uh, addressing those, those really big pictorial structural issues, um, we can't, we can't truly address the crisis. Um, so I guess I wanted to ask you guys kind of a general question. I'm sure we have some, um, some writers listening in today. I assume we do. What advice would you give to, to writers, to writers today, um, starting out writing novels, wanting to write novels, thinking about including climate change in, in their, in their books, any advice or thoughts? Maybe those are two different questions and that's fine. I mean, I'm always very wary of giving advice because I kind of think, you know, yeah, I, I'm always very wary of giving advice because I kind of think, you know, I mean, I know how to write my books, but I, do. Yeah, um, yeah. But I mean, and, and even then I'm not quite sure that I do most of the time. Um, but I mean, I do think that, you know, it, it's, I think that it's, I suppose to not be afraid of addressing it and to not think that there is a right way or a wrong way of doing yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it doesn't have to be, um, you know, you don't have to write a book which is kind of face on to it, um, can have it be there around the edges. You know, if you have characters that are getting on with their lives, um, it's, you know, it, it can kind of, it can, it can creep in, you know, there's an awareness of it in the way that, that we now have, the awareness, I think most of us have this awareness of it kind of all the time um, to a greater or lesser extent. You know, and, and how does that inform our lives? Um, how does it affect the decisions that we make? Um, you know, th those are those are also really interesting questions and you don't have to write a kind of, um, you know, full on um, dystopian climate fiction novel in order to be interested in those questions and engage with them. Absolutely, absolutely. Do you have any um, general advice to writers today? Like, I don't know about getting the work done or discipline or, or what has helped you be able to write an entire book, let's say. Do you have any kind of, if you had one thing, what I guess- I have one advice. thing, I have one thing. Right, this is my big thing. I say this so often, right. Okay. right. <laughs> So yes. excited. <laughs> I wrote, no, it's great. Okay, I wrote some short stories and oh, right. <laughs> that was really good. But I was absolutely terrified of writing a novel. And I, you know, that that feeling of like, I can't write a novel. Like, how do you even write a novel? Like, what do you I know? So this is I this is literally what I did. I Googled how long is a novel, and this <laughs> says it's 50,000 words. And if you divide 50,000, if you divide 50,000 words by the number of days in a year, minus weekends, because you get those off. Gotta have those up. It's 192 words a day. That is all you have to write. 192, that's like four sentences. 192 words a day. Take the weekends off. By the end of the year, you've written a novel. It's you know what? I have to confess that I, I do the same thing. I say, okay, I want my novel to be between 75,000 and 80,000 words. Let's, let's, uh, what's my average output um, before I lose my mind, you know, and it's, I, I can only cook for like five hours max and that's a lot. And then I, and I just did the math. And I'm like, you know, you can, you can do that. I think that's, I mean, of course that does not include revisions, you know, and actually thinking about what you're writing, you know, doesn't include like, do you structure beforehand? Do you, do you, nope. Just no. Oh my God. Okay. Um, but I mean, I also was writing this, but I mean, things have changed a little bit when, when I was writing this book, I had two small children. So okay. um, I was having, write it first like very early in the morning so I, d I didn't have time for anything other than like 
absolutely kind of <laughs> tasks. No, no planning. Can't yeah, 21 minutes. Yeah. Do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was like an hour and 15 minutes separate between sort of, yeah, they got them up in the morning and gave them breakfast. Um, and, and while he you was. You did it. You did it. <laughs> you did it. And, and Allegra, what about you? What about, you know, what would you tell someone writing a book with climate fiction elements and, and you know, what's, what's your process in writing? And Well, I, I think writing a novel uh, is is really hard and no matter what it's going to be hard it's going to take a long time um and in order to kind of get through that that diff- difficulty and maybe you know come to the come to the page day after day to go through what may be years of revision you don't know um i think it's important that you're writing about something that you really care about and that really matters to you and that there's uh, a, a kind of core of your being that's kind of willing to go through the uncertainty that also comes along with working on a book and i know that for me i knew i wanted to i knew i wanted to write about climate change and to um kind of contribute to a larger conversation and that this felt like a way that i could in a, a very small way contribute and so um, that helped me get through the, the many years that it took to, to research, um, to compose, to revise endlessly, to create this um, document. So that, that would be um, my, my hot tip. That's a hot tip. And what do you, <laughs> what do you say, um, I was going to say, what do you do about the dark days? I mean, what, what about the days that like, oh, okay, so um I don't I'm lost with the book or, or I just have issues that feel unresolvable do you have any sort of ideas for that not that I'm talking about myself right now <laughs> <laughs> I'll I mean, be all right I think there's a there's a lot of different ways one can kind of handle those uh those moments I always I like to light a candle and set the mood oh, I, I do candles um I have I have burned so many candles my <laughs> yeah. husband's like make sure you blow that sucker out when you're, I'm like, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Um, I think uh, sometimes when I'm really stuck on something, I'll, I'll write the question down and um, right before I go to bed and see if I can, I can dream up an answer. And um, I know that might be a little woo woo for, Mm -hmm. for some folks, but I really believe in, in the subconscious. And so by letting your brain continue to work on things, even if you kind of consciously can't quite untangle it, I found really helpful. I do that all the time. I just, when you reach the end of your rope, you're like, okay, time to get some real sleep. No, and I don't know about Jesse. Does that work for you? Good night, sleep. And you're like, okay, here we go. <laughs> Not sleep, but I um, I mean, I I so I run the the, the first you thing. Run. Oh, okay. Yeah, because I think so. I think that there. I mean, I think that 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 finding a way finding a way of spending time which keeps your body physically busy while leaving your mind kind of free. So things like you know washing up and running and ironing sometimes gardening you know like those really kind of quite repetitive mm-hmm. little tasks I look uh, forward to laundry and, because that yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah those I mean those are the times that you it feels like your mind can kind of roam like free roam and and then and then but but it's not the same as kind of sitting down and being like right now is my thinking time like now I have to do <laughs> yeah because that doesn't work like you have to you have to kind of trick it into into doing its thing somewhere else and then quite you know ping that's the answer so every morning I get up and I run and then while I'm running you know you know not not I'm not kind of necessarily consciously thinking about what I'm going to be trying to do but while I'm you know quite often I'll think oh yeah hang on um, that's that's the thing that I need to to do to, um you trick it into thinking I like that yeah. you trick the muse <laughs> I don't really want to know the answer to that question. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, also like, you know, if writing is a job, like 90% of all jobs is horrible. That's just that's job. That's what, that's what they're like. So it's, you know, writing is not going to be any different to, to that. Like there's like a small number of days where it feels absolutely wonderful, but you can't get those without having all of the other days where it is. Yeah. 
because yeah. it's still 192 words a day and I still have to sing, you know, yeah, yeah. I still have to be good. <laughs> but um, you, oh, the almost questions, I want to ask them about their what they're writing next. And, that, Absolutely. and, then, and then I'm done. So, um, <laughs> yeah, what do you got on the burner, ladies? Jesse, what's next for you? Are you are in the middle of something? Yeah, I am. It's been going like really badly. So. <laughs> sorry to laugh I, no no it's fine no I feel like maybe it's finally coming together I don't know I mean I think that it's felt really weird to try and write in the last couple of years kind yeah. of post COVID because it you know it's the same sort of problem like it feels I, I, I don't feel like I can write a novel that directly addresses it because it I, I can't find a way of doing it that wouldn't be really crass you know like what story are you going to choose out of all those stories and which one of those is justice to all of the stories that actually just ended you know right. um, but on the other hand it feels really difficult not to write about it so, right. so finding a way it feels like I've just spent kind of a year trying to find a way of of doing that and I, I think that maybe I'm sort of getting there or maybe I don't know maybe I'm not <laughs> you'll so. get there you'll get there um Allegra did um, I hear something about vegan zombies? Yeah, I have a, <laughs> I have an, uh, another story collection actually coming out this March. Um, it's Yay. called the, the Last Catastrophe, and in many ways, the stories are I would say cousins of Eleutheria. They're also dealing with um, ideas that maybe I was wrestling with that I couldn't fit into the novel, um, <laughs> and uh, maybe the uniting theme of it is around the idea of global weirding, um, which is another way people talk about global warming where it's it's not just temperature rise, it's the way everything has just gotten kind of weird, weird and strange, you know, whether it's animal behavior or it's how we live our lives. And so I take the idea of global weirding, maybe metaphorically at times, and um, I, in a, the story that have um, emerged uh, include vegan zombies, Girl Growing a Unicorn Horn, um, Finishing School in Space, which I promise is connected to climate change too. Um, I'm really excited <laughs> okay. about this this, uh, this collection. Yeah, and excited to share it. And and Erica, how about you? Are you working on something? Oh God, I'm just the moderator. Um, oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so I am, I'm writing a thriller um, called The Intelligence um, about nature turning on us. That's kind of all I can really say right now. Another and big trip coming up? I actually already made the trip. Um, and um, yeah, I just, I don't have my my little speech done for this yet, but yeah, that's, that's what it's about, nature. Nature has had enough and is um, coming back at us, so. Yeah. Uh, so there is a question here, and it would be good to end on a on a an optimistic note. And all of your books actually do have optimism in them, and the importance of activism and loving relationships and tackling this together. Uh, looking at you know certainly looking at animals to to see what they're up to. Um, one of our uh, audience members is asking, "What do you think about in desperation there is hope?" Well, I mean, I, I, uh, I am not a person who's who's ready to to give up on us or the the planet yet. Um, I think that human human beings have um, figured figured out a, a lot. We've gone to the moon. Um, we've invented the internet. We've um, we've found ways to kind of come together and problem solve and do seemingly impossible things and. So I kind of hold on to human beings' um, ingenuity and also um, the, the potential for um, collective action, for um, collective compassion. And uh, I know that that is not an easy road, but I, I think it's still there and available to us. Allegra? Um, I'm yeah. Allegra. That's Allegra. I'm Jesse. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. You know, because of the day. <laughs> um, no, it's fine. Um, yeah, I think, um, you know, I, I sort of agree with that. I think that one of the things that I, I found very interesting is the idea of the extent to which 
our kind of human coping mechanisms are fairly maladaptive in the face of the climate crisis. So we're really, really good at getting on with our life. Like, you know, that it's like faced, yeah, right, exactly. you know, faced with unbelievable circumstances, people just crack on um, to whatever extent they can. Um, and that's allowed us as a kind of species to, to sort of get this far. But when, when that becomes, it, it's like that mechanism has kind of enabled us to not have to deal with with, with climate change because we you know you can kind of think well okay yeah it's bad but we've still got to make the lunch so we're going to make the lunch and then after lunch we've got to make the dinner and we've got to make the dinner and now we've made the dinner and now it's time to go to bed and you can kind of keep on going like that indefinitely yeah and and it's like you know that that survival mechanism just doesn't work in in this because we're just digging ourselves deeper and deeper into this hole so yeah. I do think that there is a lot of hope. I think that, you know, I think that we, we can still do things, but I think we also need to, to, to look at ourselves and look at, you know, psychically what, what kind of, what it is in us that's, that's making it so hard for us to act. Um, you know, and, and I think that there's a lot of things politically, which, which are kind of tied up with climate crisis, which are hard, but there's also things which are, you know, deep, deeply embedded in what it is to be a human, which make us uniquely, which make this uniquely difficult to deal with. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I'm going to quote, that's beautifully put. Um, I'm going to quote you, Allegra, even though you're right there. Um, you say, it's also boring. This is climate change. It's boring, slow moving and intangible. How do you talk about something that's everywhere and nowhere? Everyone's fault and no one's fault. I was like, okay, yeah, I, pretty much it right there. <laughs> that's big blobby horrible thing and we are all grappling with it right now that is true um, well i i want to thank our authors uh, erica forensic for moderating jesse greengrass and allegra hyde for joining us from near and far this was wonderful and uh you know i suppose it had the potential of being a total downer but it wasn't. It really, really wasn't. And I urge everybody to buy these books. They're just terrific. Absolutely. Thanks also to our sponsors who help keep the LitFest free to you all. Please consider a donation. You can go to SalemLitFest.org and click donate. And a final thanks to our audience. You can buy our author's books at our sponsor, which is Wicked Good Books in Salem, Massachusetts, Copper Dog Books in Beverly, Massachusetts, or of course, from your favorite bookseller in the UK or in the Midwest or wherever. Uh, and I do want to add, uh, Jesse and Allegra, please visit the Salem Athenaeum if you are in the area. Uh, it is a wonderful place. And Erica, you have a standing invitation to just jump in your car and come over to Salem. Yeah, but I avoid it around Halloween because- Oh, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Wait, oh wait until middle of November, maybe. Witches will be gone again. Okay. <laughs> That's true. Well, coming up next at five o'clock, our last panel of LitFest 2022, we end on a much lighter note, seriously funny humor in fiction. So do stay with us if you can. And again, thank you so very much. We just, uh, we just are so grateful for all of you being here. Enjoy the rest thank of the weekend. You. Thank you so Take much, care. everyone.